Okay, welcome everyone to the Ethel Brown Harvey Postdoctoral Seminar Series. My name is Chi Chong Wu, and I'm a postdoc at MPI Heart and Lung Research. And we'll be moderating today with Whitney Edwards, a postdoc at UNC Chapel Hill. We are excited to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members. Today, Maria Sali from Stanford and Mohamed Simsek from Cincinnati Children's will share their research. Each speaker will give a 20 minute talk followed by 10 minutes Q&A. So please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. So let me introduce the first speaker of today, Maria. Maria began her college education at Santa Rosa Junior College and later moved to UC Berkeley and finished her bachelor uh, in molecular and cell biology. She then moved to Columbia University to study her PhD and fair enough there, of course, with developmental biology and C. elegans as a model. And since 2015, she moved to Stanford to do her postdoc in Jessica Feldman's lab and was awarded a F32 fellowship in 2016 and a K99 last year. So Maria is not only a talented researcher, but also a very dedicated mentor. And she had mentored more than 10 students since grad school. And so today she will tell us about how par polarity proteins help construct a functional intestinal tube in C. elegans. So Maria, we are all looking forward to your talk and the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you so much Chi-Chung for that very kind introduction. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. Okay, let me know if you can't see it, but otherwise I'll get going. Um, so thank you, I'm so excited to be able to present my most recent work to you all today. Um, I am interested in the, uh, I'm interested in how epithelial tissues navigate different challenges to develop from a primordium into a functional organ, a process that I think is really beautifully illustrated in this timeline of C. elegans intestinal development here. And today I'm going to tell you about a role I found for the apical par polarity complex in helping the developing C. elegans intestine to navigate two particular challenges, cell division and cell shape change. Epithelia are comprised of adherent layers of cells that line our organs and separate our bodies from the outside world. They are highly polarized along an apical basal axis with the apical surfaces facing outward where cells can interact with the air in the lungs or food in your intestines and basal lateral surfaces that face inward. And surrounding these cells are belts of adhesive junctions that help adhere cells together. And in order for an epithelial tissue to have integrity, these cells need to form the correct cell-cell connections and they also need to collect, uh, correctly polarize uh, at the tissue level. All these cells collectively need to build their apical surfaces facing outward. Now, uh, these tissues are not static. They're in fact quite dynamic. And during development and tissue homeostasis, oftentimes these tissues uh, encounter and have to overcome different assaults on their integrity. These are events that we could imagine would be really disruptive to epithelial uh, function and arrangement. These include things like cell division, uh, cell shape change, as well as many other examples that we can think of, of challenges that these tissues have to overcome all without perturbing their integrity. And this is a problem that's not specific to C. elegans. This is gonna be true for any epithelial tissue in any animal. Uh, and here I'm showing a couple more examples, a dividing mouse intestinal cell, and also the pretty drastic shape changes that Drosophila embryonic cells have to undergo during gastrulation. And so I wanna understand how epithelial tissue integrity is maintained during development despite these types of assaults. So the model that I use to study this question is the embryonic C. elegans intestine. Uh, the primordial intestine consists of 16 cells that initially polarize around a central midline. All of the cells collectively build their apical surfaces at that midline, which is where a lumen will eventually form. A subset of the cells marked in red uh, that I call the star cells will go on to divide again, and all of the cells will have to undergo a certain amount of remodeling and cell shape changes in order to build a functional intestinal tube, which if you open it up like a clamshell, you'll see has a continuous lumen running down the center with apical surfaces facing that lumen and bounded by junction proteins. And today's talk uh, is gonna be broken into two parts. The first part is studying how these cells, uh, tissues are able to overcome cell division. And part two will focus on how they're able to under, uh, overcome some of the additional cell shape changes all in the process of building this uh, critical uh, organ. So as I mentioned, uh, epithelial cells are highly polarized. They asymmetrically localize many different proteins and structures. 
Uh, and so we wanted to know what happens when epithelial cells divide. Do they retain this asymmetry or do they kind of throw it all away, divide, and then rebuild it again? Well, one thing that we know has to happen is these cells have to rearrange their microtubule cytoskeletons. So in interphase, many epithelia use their apical surface as a microtubule organizing center, or MTOC. That's the main acronym that you're going to want to remember for this talk. Uh, this apical MTOC builds parallel arrays of microtubules that support polarity maintenance and intracellular transport. However, when these cells go on to divide, they must rearrange their microtubules around centrosomes to build a bipolar spindle that segregates the chromosomes. And then once the daughters are born, those daughters enter interphase and they return back to having an apical MTOC. And this cycle we can observe with the star cell divisions. So first let's walk through just the, um, what this looks like when these star cells divide. Uh, initially, the star cells will begin to elongate and spread down the face of the intestine, eventually dividing. Um, taking the two cells into four cells. But we're gonna view this from the vantage point of our microscope, which is a, a dorsal top-down view. And so what that looks like is that initially you have an apical MTOC organizing microtubules. Uh, when the right and left cells divide into the plane of the slide, and I wanna emphasize, these are two different cells dividing into the plane of the slide, this is not one cell. When they divide at the same time, you see a gap form in the apical MTOC, and that gap fills in after the division completes. And you can see that nicely with these live images pulled from a movie where you have an apical MTOC, a gap forms when the right and left cells divide, and it fills back in. So with this system, we can ask what happens to these polarized structures when epithelial cells divide. And what we found is that everything microtubule associated that we examined leaves the apical surface during the division. However, the apical PAR complex and actin both remain behind when these cells are dividing. So this was really exciting to us. The apical par polarity complex is a very highly conserved uh, protein complex consisting of scaffold and kinase proteins. Uh, it plays important roles in promoting apical polarity and junction remodeling. And so we wondered whether the par complex might remain at the apical surface and function as a memory mark to help direct the return of microtubules back to the apical surface after a division. So to uh, ask this question, we wanted to deplete the PAR complex proteins. Um, these are essential proteins though, so we use a tissue specific degradation system uh, where uh, briefly what we do is add a degron and GFP tag via CRISPR to a gene of interest. In this case, we chose the complex member PAR6 because work from Jeremy Nance's lab showed that you don't need PAR6 to establish polarity in the gut. We didn't wanna just screw up polarity in general. Uh, once we made this allele, we're then able to add in with an intestine-specific promoter, uh, a degrader that is a component of an E3 ligase complex. This recognizes and targets PAR6 for degradation only in the gut. So these are PAR6 gut minus. Uh, and hopefully you'll appreciate that PAR6 is left unperturbed outside of the gut, allowing all the other uh, tissue development to proceed normally. So with this system, we're able to deplete PAR6 in the gut and ask what the consequence is to the MTOC. So first, I'm showing you a control movie. Uh, the gut is to the right of the dotted line, so that's where you should direct your eyes. Uh, and this movie on the left has stills pulled out to the right, so pick whichever one is easiest for you to look at. Uh, but what I hope you appreciate is that a gap forms briefly and fills back in over the course of the star cell division. So that's the normal course of events. However, when PAR6 is depleted, we see that gap form, but that gap persists over time and doesn't fill back in like the control. And in fact, if we look at much older embryos at a stage that's uh, when the control embryos have long since reestablished their apical MTOC, we see in the PAR6 gut minus very frequently these persistent gaps in uh, the MTOC where the star cell divisions occurred. So we wanted to know whether these gaps are caused by mitosis itself or whether there's some other, um, there, there's some other factor that contributes to gap formation at this anterior end of the intestine. And so we used a, a mutation that blocks the star cell divisions, uh, introduced it into the PAR6 gut minus background, and found that this significantly suppresses the star cell gap phenotype that we observe, indicating that mitosis indeed is causing these uh, defects. So to summarize what I've showed you so far, the apical PAR polarity complex remains at the midline during mitosis, and that PAR6 helps return the MTOC to the midline after the divisions. And without PAR6, mitosis appears to cause a persistent MTOC gap at the location of uh, the star cell division. So 
Do these MTOC gaps cause defects in the larval intestine? Fortunately, since we're doing tissue specific depletion, these embryos do actually hatch and form larvae, unlike a global depletion of PAR6. So this gave us a nice opportunity to understand the functional consequence of having these embryonic MTOC gaps. So to see if there were any kind of gross level developmental defects in these worms, we just asked whether there were developmental delays. So in control embryos, uh, we, uh, a control embryo will hatch into the first larval stage, L1, and develop into adulthood in about three days. Um, however, when we look at the PAR6 gut, oops, ah, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, when we look at PAR6 gut minus, we see a fully penetrant L1 arrest. So these worms arrest and die at the L1 stage. So clearly big problems from loss of intestinal PAR6. So to understand why they are getting stuck in development, we uh, chose to uh, carry out a functional uh, feeding assay, a Smurf feeding assay, where we feed worms food that's been dyed with blue food coloring, and it labels the entirety of the lumen, uh, which I hope you can appreciate in this uh, control worm here on the right. Uh, and so we were thinking that this assay would help us assess if there is a barrier defect, in which case we might see blue food leaking out into the body, or if there's defective lumen formation, in which case we might see trapped food. And what we see is that indeed food gets trapped at the very anterior end of the intestine. Um, the intriguing thing about the position of this blockage is that in 94% of uh, these obstruction cases, uh, the, uh, the obstruction occurs where the star cell daughters are, so where those cell divisions had occurred. And excitingly, um, we were able to partially suppress that phenotype as well that when we block the star cell divisions from happening, uh, more, uh, more larvae are able to form a continuous lumen at the star cell daughter position, and we instead start to see later obstructions more posterior in the intestine. So now to our summary, we can add that these MTOC gaps that we saw in the embryo uh, appear to correlate with le uh, lethal defects in larval lumen formation uh, where food gets trapped at the very anterior end of the intestine. So you may have noticed in some of my uh, in some of the images that the gaps that we observe don't only affect the star cells. While about 60% of the gaps we observe are in the star cells, another 40% are in non-dividing non-star cells. So if we look at what's happening during intestinal development apart from the divisions, one very obvious thing that jumps out is that the intestine is going a significant amount of elongation over this uh, time window. Uh, elongation of the intestine requires pretty dramatic remodeling of the cells where they have to resize their apical and basolateral domains and remodel their junctions in order to keep tissue integrity to accommodate this new shape of the intestine. So we wondered whether these uh, additional gaps arise during elongation. So to just uh, show you controls first, we see a nice continuous midline in control embryos that as the intestine elongates, you can see that the MTOC stays continuous all the way through over the course of this hour. However, when we look at PAR6, uh, we see the expected gaps where the star cell divisions are. These are all marked with these yellow arrowheads. However, we also start to see gaps arise in non-star cell positions over the course of elongation, suggesting that yes, indeed, uh, these, uh, per, that, <laughs> that gaps are arising as the intestine is elongating. Uh, in addition, we found that it's not just loss of PAR6, but uh, loss of other PAR complex members, the kinase APKC and the Rho GTPA CDC42 also cause similar phenotypes where we get gaps in star cells and in non-star cells. So we were really wondering what is causing these midline gaps in MTOC proteins. Well, one possibility, since we know that the PAR complex is important in junction remodeling, one possibility is that these cells are just falling apart. But as I hope you can appreciate from these images, especially the GFP ones where the cell membranes are marked, these cells do not appear to be falling apart. We've never saw anything that looked significantly different from control versus any of these three um, depletion backgrounds in terms of cells, um, cell adhesion. So we don't think that it's just that the cells are falling apart. So what else could it be? One possibility was that uh, these regions, these stretches of midline have lost their apical identity. And so to assess that, we looked at uh, apical and junctional markers, and we found that where there are gaps in the MTOC proteins, we also see gaps in apical markers and in junctional markers. And so suggesting that these MTOC gaps are actually reflecting regions of the midline that have lost their apical identity. 
So in uh, many cases, they are, uh, in many systems, it's been shown that the apical surface is important for driving the formation of lumen. So we wondered if perhaps in these gap regions where we don't have an apical, we don't have an apical domain, do those regions of the midline perhaps fail in lumen formation? So to assess that, we looked at the membranes of larval intestines, and we see one, I hope you can see at a gross level that these are very severely perturbed intestines as compared with control intestines, which are nice and continuous with an open lumen running all the way through. In these PAR6 gut minus intestines, we see these edematous swollen regions throughout the intestine, often flanked by regions of luminal constriction where we don't actually see any evidence of the lumen being open at all. In addition, when we look at apical and junctional markers, we see that apical and junctional proteins localize to these edematous cysts. However, these brackets are marking the regions between the cysts where we see a gap in protein localization. We don't see apical or junctional markers between them. And so we think that that does uh, suggest that these regions of membrane that lost their apical identity uh, have failed to make lumen there. So to summarize what I've shown you in part two uh, is that during elongation, the PAR complex is important to maintain MTOC continuity, continuity in non-dividing cells. That without PAR6, midline gaps form in apical and junctional domains. And I didn't show you, but we also found that basolateral proteins generally mislocalize along the midline. And that in, uh, when we look at the intestines, uh, we see that midline gaps appear to result in multiple luminal obstructions uh, in the larva, which again, we think likely reflects a failure of lumen formation at the regions of the midline that lost their apical identity. So uh, one thing that was surprising to us when we were doing these uh, studies is that CDC42 gut minus larvae, while they were affected, they weren't nearly as severely affected as PAR6 and APKC uh, gut minus larvae. And when we look uh, using this membrane marker again at their intestines, while we do see edematous regions and regions of luminal constriction, the vast majority of these intestines look pretty darn good with an open lumen. So again, way less severe than PAR6 or PKC3 gut, uh, APKC um, gut minus. Uh, and so if we look um, on mass uh, at the overall uh, distribution of luminal constrictions in larvae, here, red, the darker red correlates with a uh, more severe phenotype. We see that PAR6 and APKC gut minus larvae generally have way more luminal constrictions than CDC42 gut minus. And this was a surprise to us because uh, in embryos, uh, the number and distribution of midline gaps uh, is not any different between these three genotypes. So what we think is happening is that early in embryonic intestine development, you need all three of these PAR complex members. But at a certain point, as the intestine continues to elongate, CDC42 is no longer required, even at a time when PAR6 and APKC are. Uh, and so uh, this result was kind of cool to us because it shows um, that different complex members are required at different stages in the development of the same tissue. Early on, you need all three complex members. A little bit later in embryonic development, CDC42 appears to become dispensable. And work done by uh, Mike Boxham's group has shown that actually the entire complex is dispensable once you hit larval stages. So the, um, the larval intestine, uh, once the, the L1 larva is born, the intestine is still very short because the animal is very small. And a lot of elongation has to happen before it reaches its adult size. Um, so what I think this, really illustrates is the power of doing these really uh, detailed in vivo developmental studies where we can uh, dissect out the different genetic requirements for different um, uh, at different developmental stages in the in the same tissue. So briefly, I'm just going to go through some of my future directions. Um, my interest is in this question of epithelial remodeling, how epithelial tissues are able to overcome these assaults of cell division and cell shape change. So the first uh, area that I'm focusing on is really trying to understand uh, the apical MTOC a little bit better and specifically how it's being regulated during cell division. So uh, as I showed you before, an apical gap forms when cells divide. We actually don't really understand why that gap forms. So how the apical MTOC is released and recruited back to the apical MTOC and how that process is coordinated with the cell cycle. Another uh, future direction for me that I'm pursuing right now is trying to understand mechanistically how PAR6 promotes epithelial remodeling. 
Uh, and so while I hope everyone's convinced that PAR6 is important, um, exactly how it's doing this role is unclear. So we hope to get some insight into that by doing uh, an in vivo biochemical approach called TurboID, where we'll be able to identify uh, candidate interactors of PAR6 that will hopefully help us to elucidate what the link is between the PAR complex and microtubule organization or junction remodeling. And finally, um, I, in collaboration with Dr. Calvin Quo at Stanford, uh, I've um, branched into uh, human development. Uh, and I wanna understand whether what we're learning in C. elegans can teach us something about how human epithelia work. So the approach here is to do gene discovery in C. elegans followed by testing in human tissue. So we take primary uh, tissue samples from patients, uh, from uh, colon samples that we're able to culture as 3D organoids these cells divide. And so the first question that I'm excited to um, investigate in this tissue is whether the PAR complex is important in dividing colon organoid cells uh, for tissue One integrity. Minute. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, I must've gone way fast because I'm already at acknowledgements. Um, <laughs> so uh, I wanna just uh, take a moment to thank uh, my mentor, uh, Jessica Feldman, who has been just really a, an outstanding person throughout my postdoc. Um, we have a really fabulous lab in yellow is team polarity. So we have uh, able to share reagents with each other. It's just been a really wonderful experience. Um, Stanford has also really great cytoskeleton and worm communities that have offered lots of uh, advice and feedback over the years. I wanna thank these folks for advice and reagent, uh, these folks for funding and you for your attention. So thank you. Thank you, um, Maria, for this excellent talk. So just to remind the audience again, if you have any questions, please type it in, in the Q&A box on Zoom. Okay, so while we are waiting for uh, questions, I, I actually have a, have a technical question. So, so you use the, the degradation system to, to deplete the PAR protein. So what exactly is the kinetics of this degradation system? Like how fast? Does the right. protein gone and so on? Does they come, do they come back? Right. So um, the uh, it I, I don't have like numbers for the for the kinetics. I know that um, for uh, so a lot of times we can assess how fast the degradation is happening when we degrade critical centrosomal proteins that can disrupt cell divisions. So for instance, a promoter that we know comes on in the four cell. Uh, intestinal stage uh, called L2. When we use an uh, L2 to drive expression of our degrader in the gut and remove important centrosomal proteins, we can get intestine. We get intestines that only have four cells. So I think it's likely that the timing is on the order of an hour. And usually, when we um, co-express something, so we can have either an SL2 or a cleavable viral peptide um, that has like an N cherry after our degrader. Uh, usually, actually, I think in all cases that I am aware of, we can see degradation before we see fluorescence from our, our marker. So we think it's very rapid. Um, the other thing that has been really nice is that uh, it just seems to work really well. So I know that sometimes people have struggled with leakiness and, and issues with, with a lot of these degrader systems. Um, this is a, a ZIF1-ZF system that was developed by uh, the Nance group that, that we helped kind of optimize to make it uh, work with our system. Uh, and it just works really efficiently and it all just depends on the power of, uh, and specificity of your promoter. Great, excellent, thank you. So um, let's see. Okay, so here, here, here's a question from uh, Whitney Edwards. So did you see death of the intestinal cells in PAR6 animals? Uh, death of the intestinal cells? Exactly, um, yeah. yeah. In PAR6 uh, minus animals, sorry. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, so we, did, we don't see any evidence of, of death of the intestinal cells. Um, they, they still move, um, the, the cells don't, they don't look necrotic in any way. I haven't done anything like staining or with cell death, but I mean, these worms are still alive after three days of being stuck at an L1 larval stage and the cells still seem to be alive. Um, and in fact, like it, it, they're very strange because they do have some aspects of polarity that are intact. So those kind of edematous swollen regions, we see apical markers localized there and form like junctional bands around them. So like the overall arrangement of polarity is correct, 
It's just that we think they're almost like just disconnected lumens um, with, with regions where, uh, with gap regions where they, they never connected properly. But pretty amazingly, the worms survive without food for a very long time. Um, and the, the cells don't seem to be dying. Right, good for them. Okay, <laughs> so another question that I have is actually, so uh, I, I understand that the, the epithelial cells, when they need to undergo cell division, of course, they, they need to change their shape and so on. So it's very stressful for them, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, that's, that's what you think PAR6 is actually partially doing there to, yeah. to, to keep the integrity. So mm -hmm. why, why do you think, evolutionary speaking, why don't they just grow in size instead of you know, by endo replication, instead of like cell division? That is, that is, so that's a great question for multiple reasons. Um, so one, these divisions that they do are actually dispensable. So if they fail, if these star cell divisions fail to happen, the worms are fine because actually all of the expansion that happens from, during uh, the larval stages as the intestine gets much bigger, all of that actually is through uh, primarily endo reduplication uh, becoming polyploid and just the cells physically becoming much larger. And rather amazingly, worms can survive. I think that we, we've seen worms that survive with only four cells instead of their normal 20, um, which is just bananas, uh, but th they are robust little critters. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, uh, I, I don't really have a great answer for, for you on that. Uh, I, I don't know if it's just that that's how it happens and that you can kind of get by either way, either by making more cells to produce enough or just by making bigger cells. I'll also say that the intestines can have up to 40 cells, maybe even more with different genetic mutants. And those intestines work just fine too. So it's like, you can kind of run the whole gamut in the gut and they're able to, to handle it. So evolutionarily, I have no idea why there are different modes for this, but it's a really interesting question. Right, 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 amazing. Okay, so, well, actually I have one more question. So um, do you have any um, sort of, I don't know, speculation how PAR6 actually helped the MTOC bring the MTOC back after uh, cell division happens? Uh, yes, so um, for that part, what I still don't know, and this is just because of technical difficulties with some of the markers, but what I think probably happens is that if I had to guess, it's that PAR6 is not physically recruiting the MTOC back to the apical surface, but that PAR6 is required more broadly for maintaining the apical surface identity. And so that in a dividing cell, you need PAR6 uh, in the PAR complex to help maintain apical identity at a time when, uh, when the cell is dividing. Like one related question that I've thought a lot about is why are dividing cells so particularly sensitive to the loss of the PAR complex? And so one of the obvious things is that you lose your apical microtubules. And so one uh, hypothesis that I am testing right now, I wish I had an answer, but soon, uh, is that I, I wanna know if the reason why dividing cells are so sensitive is because you've lost your apical microtubules and you've lost your PAR complex. Apical microtubules, of course, can help have directed traffic, uh, trafficking of materials to the apical surface. And so um, what I'm trying to figure out is if I simultaneously disrupt microtubules and the PAR complex, does that perturb uh, apical integrity across the gut, including in non-dividing cells? Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I, I still have one more question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, interested in this topic. So, so do you think, um, or did, uh, so, so I mean, like you said in the beginning, like your softler, you know, gastrulations and all this, uh, it's very important, you know, cell shape changes and all these part protein complexes. Do you, are they actually very conserved in terms of functions or are there different complexes that are doing the same jobs in different organs, in different, mm -hmm. different cells or different organisms? Right, so um, there are regions of these proteins that are really highly conserved and regions that are more divergent. So they all have um, a lot of similar domains. So, you know, the, the kinase domain of the uh, APKC is very highly conserved in different organisms. Um, the, I, I can't remember in terms of sequence identity, but there, there are different like protein binding domains that are the same flavor that are, are highly conserved. Uh, and kind of shockingly, they, uh, they do seem to do a lot of the same functions in different tissues and make a lot of the same interactions. 
But one of the other weird things is that uh, not every epithelium has the same requirement for these proteins. So uh, for instance, um, another PAR complex protein that I didn't mention called PAR3, uh, that is required to establish polarity in the first place in the intestine. Uh, but in the skin, it's dispensable. You don't need PAR3 to establish polarity. So uh, PAR3 would be part of kind of like a different flavor of, of PAR complex. There's a couple flavors. Um, and so for, uh, let's see, sorry, I just kind of got <laughs> off track in my own thoughts there. Um, but uh, so there does seem to be a high degree of conservation because there are a lot of tissues that depend really heavily on the PAR complex for apical, um, for apical uh, building an apical surface or for remodeling junctions. Uh, but there also seems to be a lot of tissue specific differences even within organisms. And so I think that it's actually a very exciting time to be studying these proteins uh, because I think the more tissues and the more different organisms we look in that we're gonna really get a sense of the, just the myriad ways that these proteins um, function and work together. Okay. So um, I think we have to move on to the second speaker. Thank you again, Maria, for this excellent talk. So now Thank you. Uh, we'll pass this to uh, Whitney. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitney Edwards. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Mohamed Simsek. Mohamed is a physicist by training. He earned his bachelor's degree in physics from the Middle East Technical University in Turkey. He then went on to obtain a master's in applied physics at Rutgers University in New Jersey. After a successful completion of his master's, Muhammad completed his PhD at SUNY Buffalo in a lab of Dr. Arne Prele, where his work focused on membrane biophysics and developing live imaging techniques. Muhammad is currently a research fellow at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in the laboratory of Dr. Uturul Uzbudak, where his work is now focused on exploring and modeling the signaling networks that are important for segmentation in the early embryo. Mohammed has been the recipient of multiple postdoctoral fellowships, and he recently received a Best Research Paper Award from Cincinnati Children's Research Foundation. I'm really excited to hear Mohammed's presentation on sequential segmentation in an embryo, morphogen gradients, and molecular oscillators. Please take it away, Mohammed. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Whitney, for the nice introduction. Um, so the question is, how do cells in an embryo make decisions in groups, one after the other, another, to create repetitive patterns? Okay. So uh, these presomitic mesoderm cells, PSM cells, used to the size of notochord in a vertebrate embryo. Uh, make this decision to sequentially segment somites in vertebrates. Uh, a morphogen gradient shown here in cyan color and a molecular clock shown in yellow color uh, provide information to PSM cells for their segmental commitment. I will highlight today our findings on how these two information are combined by the cells and how we can drive somite boundaries at will in the absence of any molecular clock input uh, by imitating the clock's effect. In the end of my talk, I will uh, try to uh, discuss some broader implications about of our finding uh, in regards of how the sequential segmentation is, is happening in diverse species uh, from chordates to arthropods. In vertebrates, her has family genes are conserved segmentation clock genes. Uh, in zebrafish, we developed a reporter line, fluorescent reporter line for her seven uh, clock molecules, which gave us a reliable uh, signal level throughout the whole PSM and uh, sh showing the endogenous clock phases. Clock genes uh, exhibit traveling uh, kinematic waves of expression uh, along the PSM, uh, which is setting the pace of the segmentation. As the somatogenesis proceeds, the PSM size shrinks, and eventually organisms end somatogenesis with species-specific number of somites segmenting. Uh, we should note here that although every single cell along the PSM is experiencing the ticks of clock at every round of segmentation, only certain cells, which are highlighted here in red color, somewhere in mid-PSM, 
are committing into segmentation for a given wave of clock expression. So what it takes to make a somite boundary, uh, to answer that question, multiple models were proposed. Uh, in classical clock and wavefront model, a positional information is provided by posteriorly sourced FGF and wind signaling uh, gradients. Uh, as the tail elongates, uh, cells somewhere in mid-PSM fall below a threshold level of FGF wind signaling, which makes them competent to respond to clock signal. And at every wave of the clock, those cells are committing into making the next somite boundary, which eventually mature into fully segmented somites. Uh, alternatively, in mice PSM specifically, uh, multiple oscillators were observed, which gave rise to phase shift type, shift type of models. In one model, for example, uh, FGF signaling oscillator needs to turn on and notch oscillator should turn, uh, turn needs to turn off and notch oscillator should turn on to be able to determine the segmental boundary. As an alternative model, uh, tail bud cells in mice PSM were observed to oscillate out of phase, which eventually uh, you know, become in phase as they get displaced towards the anterior PSM. And this phase matching between wind and notch oscillators were uh, proposed to determine success of segmentation. As a, uh, another alternative model, local uh, reaction diffusion type, Turing type reaction diffusion model was proposed to convert clock gene expressions, uh, oscillations into fixed patterns of stripes, which mark the segment boundaries. Uh, so to rephrase infamous code on Feynman's blackboard, uh, if we cannot create somite boundaries at will, we, will, we do not understand the process. And in result, we do not know how to solve the sequential segmentation problem that nature has solved many times in various species. Previously, uh, in our published work, we had shown special fault change uh, detection mechanism is actually at work to provide positional information for some high boundaries in zebrafish PSM. Uh, for that, when we quantified FGF signaling levels uh, for various stages of somite development, uh, somitogenesis, uh, we and also observed the boundary commitment positions shown here in vertical dashed lines, we have seen that actually cells do not commit into segmentation at a constant threshold of signaling levels. Rather, uh, as the time proceeds, the PSM size decreases and the gradient also shrinks and gets uh, steeper. In parallel, the wavefront position climbs up the gradient, as you can see here, keeping the ratio between the slope of the gradient and the readout of the gradient constant at a 22% difference between neighboring cells uh, throughout the whole stages of somitogenesis. We also had tested that SFC special fault change detection mechanism under various perturbations and confirmed it and showed that wind signaling can only uh, provide segmentation information, position information for somi segmentation through SFC special fault change of FGF signal. Knowing what the actual wavefront is in the zebrafish PSM, we sought to understand how cells interpret clock and wavefront signals uh, to make the boundaries. For that, we used the previously published chromosomal deficiency line, which lacked both HER1 and HER7 uh, key oscillators of zebrafish clock, and in result, unable to make proper somite boundaries. And in those experiments, we used the presomitic mesoderm size as a proxy for developmental time. Uh, and the logic here is basically within a given somite stage, uh, as the axis elongation is continuous, a longer PSM size would mean that uh, it corresponds to a later phase of development. When we phase sorted uh, with that logic, same somi stage embryos of clock mutants into three groups, we have realized a monotonous regression of FGF signaling gradient in clock mutants. Interestingly, we discovered in the clock intact siblings, uh, the FGF signaling gradient does not simply regress posteriorly, rather it also oscillates in amplitude. So these results showed us that segmentation clock actually drives amplitude oscillations in FGF signaling. We next asked the question whether clock represses or activates FGF signaling. To answer this question, uh, we utilized uh, a previously published clock overexpression line under Hishop promoter. Uh, 
and we verified that we can get higher level of clock proteins even as at heat shock durations as short as 10 minutes. And interestingly, within that short duration of 10 minutes heat shock, we have seen a, about 35% drop in uh, FGF signaling levels due to the clock overexpression, which is comparable with the drops we observe in wild type embryos due to the endogenous clock expression. So these results showed us that segmentation clock is swiftly decreasing the FGF signaling to drive those oscillatory dynamics in FGF signaling gradient. We further quantified dynamics of clock and FGF signaling in live PSM tissues utilizing our uh, 3D explant system. For that work, uh, our talented PhD student, Angad, utilized adapted ERK-ATR technology uh, to generate a double transgenic reporter fish, uh, which reports the ERK activity in BFB channel together with our clock reporter, HER7 Venus, uh, shown here in magenta color. The KTR uh, reporter's cytoplasmic localization you see here in posterior PSM indicates a higher ERK activity, so higher FGF signaling which is quantified here in the lower left panel. In live, uh, in live measurements, we confirmed the oscillatory dynamics of the uh, ERK activity FGF signaling amplitude in the posterior PSM when we track the posterior PSM. Uh, alternatively, if we stick to the same group of cells as they get displaced along the PSM due to the axis elongation, and fall off the gradient. We have seen sudden drops of FGF signaling levels, ERK activity levels, as you can see here, every time clock wave passes. So ERK activity oscillations were already reported in mice PSM, and sudden drops of FGF signaling was reported for zebrafish uh, in a clock-dependent manner. Our results showed that these previous findings are two sides of the same coin, which uh, indicates that clock immediately decreases FGF signaling levels to drive its oscillations as a deeply conserved mechanism among the vertebrates. So a trivial question one can ask at that moment is, how can an oscillatory gradient still with that fast dynamics still provide a reliable positional information for segmental commitment? In other words, how does this coupling between segmentation clock to FGF uh, and FGF signaling affect the wavefront. Uh, for that, we came up with a discrete shift model uh, in which we thought in clock mutants, the wavefront will simply, corresponding to a specific value uh, on the gradient, uh, will simply follow upstream FGF signaling and axis elongation, so regress posteriorly in a monotonic manner. However, in clock intact wild type embryos, when clock stripe is expressed on uh, top of the wavefront position, it will lower the FGF signaling levels, whereas the cells trailing behind the clock stripe will recover from the repression of the clock, uh, making the slope to get steeper uh, in a uh, fast dynamics. And as the slope increases and the levels decrease, the ratio of slope over the signal will make a sudden posterior shift, uh, which will you know, change the position of the wavefront. But when the clock later on moves to the anterior PSM or the next clock wave emerges from the posterior PSM, they will have no impact on the wavefront position in mid PSM. Uh, we simulated this regulatory mechanism by incorporating clock's repression on PPRC levels. And we have seen PPRC is oscillating. And uh, we have seen SFC of PPRC, the wavefront, is making those anticipated uh, discrete shifts in position, marking somite boundaries. Then we went back to our experimental data and observing the position of wavefront by uh, checking out the critical value of the SFC, which is marking the wavefront in clock mutants. We have indeed seen that uh, wavefront is continuously regressing in clock mutants. However, when we checked out our data in the uh, clock intact siblings, uh, we have observed a quite stationary SFC profile for a while, keeping the wavefront position constant until the clock wave comes and shifts it posteriorly, marking the next determined somite boundary. So discovering this discrete shift mechanism, uh, we can then ask a key question that does the clock instruct segmentation only by the discrete shifts of the wavefront? And if that is the case, can we drive segmentation without a molecular clock? Uh, 
So to answer that interesting question, we designed an experiment uh, where we treated clock deficiency, chromosomal deficiency mutant embryos with SU5402 drug uh, inhibiting FGF receptors. We reasoned that if we can lower the FGF signaling levels in clock mutants with the drug treatment, uh, and then recover that decrease of the signal in the washout steps, we can imitate the effect of clock on FGF signaling in clock mutants. After optimizing drug concentrations and treatment durations, we indeed succeeded to drive amplitude oscillations in FGF signaling gradient, and we were able to get the targeted aimed posterior shifts, sudden discrete shifts of the wavefront position in clock mutants as it was happening in wild-type clock intact embryos. Uh, note here that despite the tremendous level of drop of FGF signaling be from before pulse to after pulse, the wavefront position did not move in these two you know, steps. However, it regressed posteriorly in the recovery. So using the pulse-style drug treatment experiments, we actually indeed was able to drive sequential segmentation of somites in clock mutants in the absence of any molecular clock input up to 12 somite boundaries shown here. Uh, however, as the uh, global treatment inhibition of FGF signaling also affects other uh, pathways of development, uh, we later on to be able to rigorously quantify the recovery of the boundaries, we reduced the number of pulses to five pulses. And when we did this rigorous quantification in an unbiased computerized manner, we have seen in median pulse style treatment experiment is able to drive four out of five somite boundaries successfully in five pulse treatments. We later on uh, in next day checked the boundary epithelialization of those rescued somites using phosphorylated focal adhesion kinase as an epithelialization marker for the boundary cells. And as you can see here uh, in this targeted somites highlighted in yellow color, uh, we saw successful epithelialization of the somite boundaries in the rescue somites. Uh, which is quantified here on the right side. And these uh, somite boundaries later on in development provide positional cue for the muscle fiber extensions, marking their ends, basically. Here we stained uh, slow twitch muscle fibers in developing somites with F59 myosin marker. And uh, we have indeed seen the muscle fibers in the rescued somites elongated to proper lengths, unlike the uh, clock mutants broken boundaries uh, uh, muscle fibers. So to sum up our results, uh, we propose a revised clock and wavefront model to explain somite segmentation. Uh, I have shown you that post-pulse style inhibition of FGF signaling can fully substitute the role of the clock for sequential segmentation, which uh, shows us that clock actually acts hierarchically upstream of the wavefront, which is contrary to the textbook definition of the clock and wavefront model. Uh, and next, I have tried to address the question that how the observed fast dynamics of the morphogen gradient can still lead it to provide robust positional information. For that question, I have shown you that uh, special fault change detection of FGF signaling is actually able to extract robust positional information for somatogenesis from the oscillatory dynamics of FGF signaling. And clock is actually acting as an analog to digital converter which converts gradual axis elongation into discrete shifts of the wavefront, uh, which we can imitate this effect by just pulse-style drug treatments. As broader implications of our findings, species as diverse as flower beetle, tribolium, and humans segment their major body axis sequentially, and these diverse species use diverse set of molecular tools as gradients and clocks shown here as a conserved uh, common architecture among uh, sequentially segmenting species, the observed sequential segmentation continues uh, following the continuous regression, posterior regression of the gradients. Uh, so our findings has a broader implication that versatile clocks actually may establish sequential segmentation in very diverse species, as long as they can inhibit those posterior gradients. With that, uh, I would like to thank uh, our funding resources, which uh, made this research possible. Members of Özbudak Lab, particularly Dr. Özbudak and Didar, 
Angad, Oriana, and Nick, who took active part in the last project I, uh, I have summarized. Uh, it was a pleasure to mentor Nick, uh, Laura, Mine, Vistam, Greg, and Bilge throughout those projects in the lab, and also collaborate with and learn from the past members of Özbudak Lab. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sharon Amaker from Ohio State, Dr. Greenwald from Columbia Universities, and Dr. Kofren, Dr. Brugman, Dr. Yin, Dr. Waxman, and Sumanas uh, from CCHMG for sharing with us their fish and reagents and equipment and technical support. Also, uh, CCHMC Wet Services and Confocal Imaging Corp. Uh, lastly, I acknowledge intellectual feedbacks we got from Dr. Kopan and Dr. Zon for our manuscripts. And I would like to thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, for that great talk. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please um, upload them into the Q&A box. Okay, we have one question so far, Mohammed. So the trigger to initiate somite differentiation is a sudden drop in p -ERC. This is very cell autonomous. Do the cells destined to be cell mites also coordinate the, between themselves? This is very cell autonomous. I'm so I think they mean, is, are, is there any communication between the other cells? No, so not just at a single cell level. Yeah, actually uh, it is okay uh, now. I I understood it. <laughs> okay, so it is a, a good question. So basically the mechanism we actually propose for cells to understand that sudden drop of PPR levels or FGF signaling levels, let me say, is actually they are comparing with their neighbors. Since we always see a 22% difference between neighboring cells uh, at that position where cells are really determining or uh, committing into segmenting the next boundary. So uh, we propose that actually cells are with a molecular mechanism, comparing with their neighbors how, how different their signaling levels are uh, and commit into segmentation. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so I guess following up from that question, um, how do you think that these cells are able to maintain this 22% difference? Like what would the molecular mechanism be? Okay, so for SFC mechanism, uh, that is a nice question. We really uh, do not know molecularly how can this be happening, but uh, there are possible uh, ways that you can calculate signal ratios uh, over time, uh, temporal fold change, uh, let me say, uh, through uh, using utilizing two arms of a molecular network, one acting quite fast and one acting slower. So the slow acting arm gives the you know, a uh, signal which happened earlier and uh, the molecules then integrate these two informations and respond as the ratio between two values. Similarly, uh, we think it's possible through a receptor ligand molecular mechanism between cells. They can, you know, which, you know, next cells basically feedback to the first cell receiving cell will come later. So they can also respond to that ratio in a uh, similar likewise mechanism. But it doesn't have to be also necessarily molecular. It can be happening uh, through a mechanical process, uh, such as like the forces cells are exerting on each other through microtubule connections, uh, which might be proportional with the difference of FGF signaling levels between cells. So everything is possible. We don't know the molecular mechanism. But in our published work, uh, like, let me just say this as last, in our published work, we have shown actually indeed that cells are actually responding to the changes in their neighbors uh, by doing transplantation experiments and dropping FGF signaling levels only in a certain group of cells. When we did that experiment, all, uh, those cells basically committed into segmenting a somite precociously earlier than their position since we dropped their FGF signaling levels. And when we dropped their FGF signaling levels, we have realized that the wild type cells actually next to these cells which are dropping in level, Although their FGF signaling levels did not drop, they also joined the cells which are committing into segmentation. So we uh, biologically observed that cells are responding to the changes in their neighbors, but we don't know how it happens. Okay. So another question I had was in the experiments where you were treating those uh, animals that were clock deficient and you were 
experimentally lowering the FGF levels yourself. When you let those animals develop, are they completely normal? Do you see any developmental defects or does this really mimic a true wild type? That is a, a good question. So basically, uh, like in the 12 pulse treatments, most of them are not able to survive next day because of, as I said, like other developmental processes also require, you know, axis elongate, also require FGF signaling. Although the axis elongation was not significantly impaired, uh, we see them uh, less surviving next day. But if when we drop the number of treatment down to five pulses, they are actually able to survive next day. And those embryos, like more than 90% survive next day. And those embryos, once they survive next day, they can also develop like as a normal embryo. And uh, one thing I should note here is those uh, chromosomal deficiency mutants we are using, they are actually not homozygous viable. But the reason they are not homozygous viable, so they die after five days post-fertilization. But the reason they are not homozygous viable is not has nothing to do with the clock mutation. It is due to it's like a big chunk of chromosomal deletion, uh, causing some other important problem genes, you know, to also get deleted from that region of the chromosome, causing them to die. Uh, we have in the lab, uh, you know, all published last year another, for example, her one or seven uh, mutant, which is able to survive up to adulthood. So. Like I didn't do the experiment with those mutants, but you know, ideally they should be able to survive up to adulthood after the treatment. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I will ask one final question. So yeah. the the dynamics between the clock proteins and FGF signaling is really quick. Do you have any idea about the mechanism by which the clock genes are actually functioning to suppress the FGF signaling? Okay, that's a beautiful question. That's like kind of the future directions we are like investigating uh, after like kind of wrapping up this uh, project and submitting it. Uh, we are suspecting certain molecules. Uh, it is a really, as you said, is a, a really fast dynamics happening within like five, 10 minutes, basically. Uh, as I showed also in the heat shock data, suddenly able to drop the earth levels. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we think it is most probably not a transcriptional regulation. We have yeah. some, you know, preliminary exper experiments supporting a post-transcriptional, actually post-translational even modification is happening there. But uh, those are like really preliminary right now. We don't know exactly. Yeah. Yes, that would be exciting to find out. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any further questions. So I think we're going to uh, wrap up here. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Thank so you. I'd like to thank both Maria and Mohammed for their excellent talks today. And I just want to remind everyone that the seminar is recorded and will be available on the SDB website starting Monday. And also a reminder to please join us for next month's seminar on Friday, December 10th, when Miguel Saavedra from National University of Ireland Galway and Suda Rashdurkar from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory will present. Thank you all for joining us today.